New U.S. sanctions on Iran took effect today. Six months after President Trump pulled the U.S. out of the international nuclear deal. The sanctions targeted the shipping, financial, and energy sectors all key to the country's already struggling economy. The bombs, which the FBI referred to as improvised explosive devices, were sent to the FBI's bomb laboratory in Quantico, Virginia. We're in Mexico again tonight as thousands of migrants try to find a faster way to the U.S. border. The White House says it's now getting help from the Mexican government. Breaking news out of Pittsburgh. The man accused in the shooting at the uh, synagogue in Pittsburgh is pleading not guilty, and he also wants a jury trial because he's facing a 44 count. So, in the final seconds before the Boeing 737 Max crashed into the water, it was traveling at more than 500 kilometers an hour. All 189 people on board were killed. You've now entered the House of Mystery. Crime, conspiracy, history, and science. With your hosts, Al Warren, Mike Brown, Julie Saab, Michael Butterfield, Dr. Joseph Usinski, and Michael Hawley. Heard on KCAA 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and uh, I'm Al Warren, of course, and uh, co-hosting today, we have Michael Butterfield. How are you doing, Mike? I'm doing well. How are you? I am always wonderful. Not really, but people don't want to hear. Hey, so Arizona, everything good still down there? Uh, yeah, still crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing's changed. So. Well, you've got a good senator, so everything's good. <laughs> yes, we have two good senators. Yeah. <laughs> Well, today we have a, a great show, action-packed, full show. We've got uh, a legend, um, hmm. Mr. Peter Vronsky. Thank you for being here, Peter. Uh, hi, Alan. Hi, Michael. Uh, thanks for having me on. Oh, of course. Of course. Uh, listen, um, wow. So what's been going on in Peter's world? I see you've got uh, a new book out, uh, American Serial Killers, The Epidemic Years, 1950 to 2000. And um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, that's a book I've kind of been itching to write for quite a while. Um, almost, you know, I'm a historian primarily of serial homicide. And almost every one of my books and looking at that history points out that there was this a three-decade uh, surge in serial killers between 1970 and 1999, where you had something like around 82% of all known American serial killers in the 20th century will make their appearance in that short 30-year period. Um, and so I felt really that somewhere there's just a book about those three decades alone. And, and so I had this kind of gap in between my last book, uh, Sons of Cain, which, you remember, the subtitle was A History of Serial Killers from, um, you know, from the Stone Age to the Present. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so that kind of, I squeezed in that book a little bit about this epidemic era, but no one has really taken a look at it as a standalone book. And so... Um, having recently researched a lot about it and um, written about it, I wanted to get out everything that I couldn't get into a book that dealt with other matters, right? And, and so this book is just dedicated to the, the rise between, you know, 1950 and 1970 when serial killing begins to ramp up in the United States and then this epidemic period which gives us of course um, the definition the term serial killer is defined in that um, era the mind hunter era of the FBI profilers and you know this era of uh, celebrity serial killers like uh, John Wayne Gacy Ted Bundy uh, Jeffrey Dahmer all these serial killers that are kind of being re 
um, recycled now on, on Netflix. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's very little new serial killer stories. We seem to retell the same serial killers of that era, almost like uh, scary bedtime stories that <laughs> children want to hear over and over. Um, and in fact, there's a whole new generation of, of, of people as well who weren't even born. When, you know, when Ted Bundy was already put in an electric chair, they hadn't been born yet, who are for the first time learning about Ted Bundy and seem to be as fascinated with this era of serial killers as we were when it was happening, when, you know, we were of that age. Well, people love the classics, right? Is well, that yeah. What and America was great. <laughs> yeah, indeed. It, it, it's a period, Harold Schechter, who is a, a, a true crime historian. He kind of tongue-in-cheek coined the golden age of yeah. um, serial killers, of serial murderers. And that was originally going to be the title of my book, uh, but the, the publishers, kind of the editorial committee, balked. I uh, say, well, you can't call it golden age. You know, I was arguing with them, like, there's golden age of organized crime, there's golden age of porn, there's a golden age of, <laughs> you know, genocidal killers. Why, you know, uh, and, and and so we kind of settled on American serial killers, and then they balked again on the term the epidemic era. Uh, mm. Oh, you know. Right now, with COVID, uh, you, you know, you can't sell a book with that epidemic in, in the title. And I kind of, you know, laughed. I mean, you know, readers who are going to read about serial killers dismembering and cannibalizing victims are hardly going to get put off by COVID, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so the epidemic years um, stayed, but uh, the golden age went in. I think it was a good compromise. I, I like the title better, American Serial Killers. It has it, kind of was a this ring something you, that only America had such a rise in, or was this around the world? No, um, there were places that also had uh, kind of rises in serial killers in that era, you know, like Germany, um, certainly England, um, so uh, Canada. It was not a uniquely American phenomenon, but certainly the numbers and, uh, you know, just the numbers per population. Uh, there was, it was different in the United States. Um, and, and I think some of the European serial killers maybe took their cue from what um, the Americans were doing, so um, I think I think the the kind of cultural differences in those countries were um, not the same as in the United States. There might have been some similarities, but there were also you know differences. And um, I didn't really look at the other countries. I strictly focused in this case on on the United States. But overall, there's a you know in some places. Um, in other places, the surges are happening now, you know, like in China or South Africa. Um, those surges, Russia, those surges occurred later for probably different reasons. I'm not going to speculate having, you know, not studied those areas intensively as I did the American experience. So what do you, account, what do you attribute this to? Like, wh why, why such an increase during those three thirty years, I um, attributed to a number of historical things in American history, um, kind of social community traumas, beginning with um, the Great Depression and the Second World War, and we're talking no not about the impact directly on the serial killers, but the impact on the families and the parents of serial killers, future serial killers. Um, you know, we often speculated on why there was this rise in the 1970s, 1980s, and 90s. We associated it with the time in which the serial killers were doing their killing. Um, you know, the kind of uh, collapse of the um, American nuclear family, 
um, the sexual revolution, the youth revolution, um, the, the civil rights movement, uh, rioting, um, the anti-war movement, um, the kind of hedonism that followed in the 1970s, uh, the greed of the 1980s, 1990s, and 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 so that, in a way, is certainly part of it. But the problem that I found in making that kind of contemporary association was that, you know, serial killer psychopathologies develop when the serial killers are very young, sometimes as young as five years old, mm -hmm. but they don't start killing statistically until they're around the age of 27, 28. That's the statistical average. So if you're going to look at someone like Ted Bundy, you've got to back him up to the time he was a child. And, of course, that takes us into the late 1940s, the early 1950s. Ted Bundy was born in 1946. He is the perfect example of a post-war um, a child that is whose nurturing generation is traumatized by the war. You know, his mother, it's unclear who Ted Bundy's father was. Mm -hmm. um, and it's suggested that um, the father was a GI who yeah. had encountered um, Ted Bundy's mother, and so we don't know. And, and so as I began to look at some of the serial killer uh, child biographies, I began to see that, that many of them recall their father returning from the Second World War in a highly traumatized state. And we underestimated the, um, you know, first of all, we didn't have that term, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. We didn't have that kind of diagnosis. Did they we call did it have, shell shock back then? I'm sorry? Did they call it shell shock back then? Well, they called it shell shock. They called it neuropsychiatric uh, wounding, but um, it, we didn't really understand um, the nature of post-traumatic stress disorder. It had terms like combat stress reaction, battle fatigue, battle neurosis. Um, it was all rolled up into a general term called neuropsychiatric casualty. And um, an astonishing 37% of American ground combat troops deployed in World War II were sent home as neuropsychiatric casualties. Um, wow. you, you know, in the 2013 Rand Corporation study of World War II casualties, this is very recent, neuropsychiatrically impaired uh, GIs represented 30% of all service-connected active disability awards. So we had a lot of our fathers and grandfathers coming back without the benefit of a PTSD um, diagnosis or that kind of therapy. They were essentially given a medal, a parade, tossed a GI bill, and told to suck it up in silence. Yeah. And, 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 and so uh, I began reading all these accounts, uh, you know, like, for example, um, uh, you know, uh, author Shawcross, his father returned mm -hmm. from Guadalcanal in, um, a, you know, very disoriented and withdrawn state. In fact, Arthur Shawcross's father had a whole other family in Australia, and he just left them there. You know, he, he was there on leave. He married someone there um, and, and, and just wandered away without a divorce, without anything. So, you know, he returned, you know, shell-shocked is not a bad word for it. That's how he returned, shell-shocked. Um, Edmund Kemper's father was um, at Anzio. Uh, he was uh, actually a commando at, at Anzio and went through very heavy combat and returned back home, not at all the same man that um, Edmund's, you know, mother, who had her own problems, um, married. Not at all the same person. That also means, you know, when we hear about the dominant mother, the kind of assertive mother, you know, women had to be that uh, in the Great Depression and in the Second World War as the men 
weren't there. Uh, and, and, and so it's not just that uh, there were these, you know, pathological uh, dominant mothers, um, the mothers have to be dominant. And, and, of course, the theory of the dominant mother in the serial killer scenario is that uh, a dominant controlling mother inhibits a male child's negotiation of their independence from their mother. And if that mother inhibits that striving for independence, the child becomes frustrated and develops these aggressive feelings towards their mother, which when they become as an adult, they supplant onto other female figures. Um, and, you know, Edmund Kemper, his last victim, was his mother. Uh, or, or you take, um, you know, um, uh, Henry Lee Lucas, who's one of his first victims, was his mother. So there is some... Um, there is certainly some level of plausibility in that dominant mother theory. Um, the other thing, of course, the Great Depression as well strips a generation of men of their pride. Um, the, you know, the ability to, um, er, you know, be the bread earner in a family was a very male thing up until, you know, the Great Depression. And, and you have a generation of men whose pride was broken by the Great Depression. Some of them couldn't bear it and, and just abandoned their family. And that's one of the things that in that FBI study, all serial killers um, mention, or I'm sorry, I shouldn't say all, but the great majority of serial killers um, uh, mentioned that by the time they were 14 years old, their father was either totally absent or withdrawn completely from their family. So, so those two decades are one factor, um, because it's never one thing. Uh, the other factor, of course, is the ubiquity of this literature, popular literature in the United States, um, true detective magazines and men's adventure magazines mm -hmm. that were sold in the mainstream, they were sold next to Life magazine, Time magazine, you know, Ladies Home and Garden Journal and so, so forth. And these magazines essentially celebrated the abduction, torture, rape, and murder of women. Their uh, covers, in the case of detective magazines, there would be uh, models posed, uh, often bound and gagged, beaten, um, and th they would be staring out from the magazine cover towards the buyer as if they are the buyer's, the reader's victim. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, you can have her for the cover price of the magazine. Um, and, and then you had the men's adventure magazines that had uh, painted covers. Um, and in, in, in this case, it was the same theme. Uh, women um, abducted, tortured, sexually molested, and, and murdered, but by Nazis or Imperial Japanese troops, North Koreans, Cubans, as, as you know, whatever the flavor of the month in the decade was. Um, so, so these magazines increasingly are found in serial killers uh, possession when they're arrested starting in the 1950s um, a lot of serial killers talk about how these magazines didn't necessarily um, trigger the desire to kill their fantasies but shaped their fantasies it gave them a script to follow to the point that I describe in my book the case of Harvey Glattman, a glamour, the oh, wow. glamour girl killer in Los Angeles, who was so obsessed with um, true detective magazine covers that he would pose as a photographer of true magazine covers and hire freelance models who he would tell them that he was... Um, shooting a True Detective magazine cover, they would allow him to bind them and, and gag them, as in the magazine cover, and then he would step into his own magazine cover and uh, rape his victims and then kill them, dumping them in the desert. Um, and, and those photographs are 
you know, Harvey Glattman photographs are still circulating on the Internet to this day because um, American press published them. Yeah. Uh, these They're images. terrifying, too. I'm sorry? They're terrifying to look at when you know the context. Yes, when you know exactly, when you know the, the, the exactly, when you know the, the context of those photographs, I mean, you're looking at um, women that are about to be m- murdered, and um, that's what triggers, in fact, uh, Dennis Radar, the, the, the mm-hmm. BTK killer. He's 14 years old, and he sees these photographs in his father's True Detective magazine, um, and and he now develops this script of, you know, binding, torturing, and killing BTK from those very, Harry, Harry, you know, Harry Glackman images. Um, so, but, but, you know, before the BTK saw those Harvey Glackman images, he was turned on by Bullwinkle cartoons. He described how, um, uh, you know, those Dudley Do-Right cartoons where... Mr. is tied to the railroad track thing. T- yeah, now tied to the railway tracks. That would, you know, turn them on. So, you know, none of these things cause or make serial killers by themselves. Um, some are inspired by biblical passages. So it's often a, a multiple Rubik's Cube of different um, kind of cocktails that create each serial killer. I've, I've never found a, you know, magic formula that guarantees the creation of a serial killer. I, you know, I wonder if um, with the current COVID and all the, the restrictions and all the events of the last few years, I wonder if that in itself will create some sort of a similar thing amongst uh, the population in 20 years. Well, that's the fear I express in um, both Sons of Cain and American serial killers. Um, COVID being the last of the traumas. Um, you know, we had this 2008 financial crisis hmm. that broke as many families as the Great Depression did. Um, we have a clandestine war on terror that uh, is not only being fought now by the fathers, but as well mothers of children. Mm -hmm. And by its nature, a clandestine war is one that cannot be openly talked about. And, and, And so you have also perhaps a repressed generation like the World War II generation of veterans coming home. You know, the Vietnam War, we all watched that on TV. We knew what went down in, in, in Vietnam and was openly talked about, uh, but not the case with the Second World War, nor the case with the war on, on, on terror. So already we see two kind of similar um, situations, and, and of course the Internet is complete. We open um, whatever imagery and fantasies are available are completely unbridled on uh, on the internet, and 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 so I see similar factors um, and wonder about the children now coming out of this last kind of trauma that we're all communally experiencing the COVID um, era. What is going to happen indeed with the children? in, uh, you know, 18, 20 years from now, if, 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 you know, if my hypothesis is correct, then certainly it's not a very optimistic, um, you know, prognosis for the future. We also have, uh, you know, this a major decline in serial murder since the 2000s. Um, there's also a decline in generally in violence and um, in homicide in the in, in the United States, and 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 so it's hard for us to say whether the decline in serial killers is kind of accompanying this general decline in in, in murder. But you know, over the last eighteen months, this decline has certainly plateaued and is beginning to curve upwards. Whether that upward curve will now mark the beginning of the next surge, you know, in the way we kind of had a beginning in the early 1960s as murders began to increase and they never decreased until 1995. 
So we're talking about, you know, a 30-year, more than 30-year period of increasing murders. Um, we've done well from 1995 till, you know, approximately a year and a half ago, but right now the jury's out in which direction, you know, murder will take. We've also, I think, become better at uh, apprehending serial killers yeah. than before. Um, either that or serial killers have become better at, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> avoiding apprehension. But that's the pessimistic interpretation that they're just better at their job. I, I think we genuinely, with DNA, first of all, uh, technology, we're certainly catching up to a lot of the surge era serial killers. I, I mean, the, the biggest cases so far that, you know, from Samuel Little to the Golden State Killer, is actually that news was the apprehension of uh, serial killers from the 1980s, 1990s, back from the, you know, that golden age period, that surge era, epidemic era period. Um, when we catch new serial killers, the, certainly statistically the number of their victims is much lower on average than, you know, the serial killers of those earlier eras. That means we're catching them earlier in their, um, quote, careers. Um, you often see references, in fact, to the apprehension of wannabe killers, wannabe serial killers, um, where we see a pathology typical of a serial killer, but we arrest them when they bungle their first crime, yeah. their first murder. And, and and so it's kind of speculative whether they would commit a second one or not, but we know the pathology well enough to say, you know, it's a safe, educated guess that this guy would have gone on killing if we hadn't caught him. So we're seeing these early apprehensions, and it's not just DNA, it's as well the fact, you know, central to any serial killer homicide investigation is connecting a number of victims to a single perpetrator. And, of course, everybody carries cell phones now. Even if the perpetrator is, as police say, forensically aware and, you know, switches off his uh, cell phone or leaves it at home um, or uses a burner, um, the victims all carry cell phones. Yeah. And, and, and so cell phone data tower hits are a big part of a serial killer prosecution now. In fact, lawyers complain to me that, you know, they're given these massive um, bound volumes of cell phone data that they can't afford to interpret for themselves to, you know, defend their their client. Um, it's it's you know a very complex depth of data, plus the ubiquity of um, surveillance cameras. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you're going to commit a crime, you're often on video at that crime location before you even thought of committing a crime. Yeah. So uh, we're all on camera now. It's no longer, you know, Andy Warhol's everybody will be, you have 15 minutes of uh, fame. Everybody is eternally recorded on uh, video no matter where they go, what they do. And, and, and so we are living in a kind of a 1984-ish world, um, and 1984 is not friendly to uh, serial killers or serial perpetrators of any kind. I just, I just wonder, but how how far a serial killer will evolve? Like, uh, if there if there if there is true a, a new surge that comes from our troubled times, um, they'll be more adapt to these um, cell phones and all the modern technology. Yes, yeah, um, they will be indeed, and um, we already see, for example, you know, some serial killers have used social media to troll for their victims, mm -hmm. so, so whatever, you know, it's always about technology. Um, Jack the Ripper might have used a, you know, horse and carriage. Uh, Harvey Glattman, by uh, the 1950s, is using this newly constructed uh, freeway system in California and, and the car, all right? Um, and, and so future serial killers will, yeah, they'll use electric cars, but they will as well 
use, you know, the, the, the kind of um, digital world as well to target their victims and um, attempt to evade justice. What do you hope uh, people get out of reading the book, American Serial Killers? Is there something that people should take home um, besides the actual, uh, you know, basic I- idea of what you're talking about? I hope that what people get, and, uh, you know, this is a kind of a very utopian thing because often I'm asked, you know, well, how do we prevent future sur- surges and the answer is unfortunately this utopian notion that we have to take care of our children better. Um, You stop serial killers when potential serial killers are four years old, five years old. That's the time. After that, it's too late. After that, they're often on a uh, kind of psychopathological trajectory towards maturity as a serial killer, and um, it can be very difficult to undo the early damage, and and so we need to protect our children better, nurture them in a much better way than we have been able to do, and that is such a, again, utopian concept. How are we ever going to do it? And, 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 you know, that makes me pessimistic about um, everything that is happening now and about this current generation of children growing up under the pressures that we have been seeing since, you know, essentially since 2008. It, it, it really seems to be almost a duplication of circumstances, war, economic trauma, um, again, the ubiquity of uh, violence, imagery, all those things combined may shape the future pathological behavior of serial killers and how they'll script what they will do and what kind of evasive techniques they may uh, adopt not to be, you know, apprehended. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just... Um... So, I just, I just at this point, um, there's a real popular, um, I don't know, I, I, you know, it's it, everything is about true crime. It, it's huge in in all over the the U.S. and Canada. The the media and the shows and the books and the podcasts, everything's going like crazy. It in is that in itself something that is going to cause something, or is that just a reaction, do you think? Well, I, I think, as I say, serial, those who will perpetrate those crimes will be nurtured by anything, you know, out there. I, I don't think our um, obsession with true crime, and, and I think that's the human condition. I mean, mm-hmm. I think the greatest um, work of true crime literature um, is the Bible. <laughs> you know, if, when you read the Bible, the first like murder, crime right? and murder and every kind of moral depravity and its punishment there. Um, I mean, it makes some of the stuff that, uh, you know, we read in modern true crime pretty tame compared to the Bible. And, and, and so I, I think humans have always been... Um, obsessed with the dark side and those who cross the dark side. It may be a way for us to measure our own, um, partly our own safety and um, maybe our own sanity or the level of good and evil in our in ourselves that interests us in what Ted Bundy did and what Ted Bundy thought and John Wayne Gacy and all these monsters. But um, I, I've always considered that our obsession with monsters as well had to do with actual serial killers. Uh, you know, vampires oh, yeah. and werewolves are actually the organized and disorganized serial killers. Uh, it's the same topology of, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of... S- Organized serial killer with social graces who can talk a victim into vulnerability, that's the vampire. The vampire shows up at your door, and he can't 
harm you unless you invite him into your home. Right? Um, the, disorganized, the disorganized serial killer who uh, just blitz attacks his victims is the werewolf. And so in Sons of Cain, I, I looked at actual werewolf trials in Renaissance-era Europe when there was a system, uh, and it was an ecclesiastical system that had to do with the prosecution of witchcraft um, and uh, lycanthropes, werewolves, yeah. fell into that judicial process. And so when I looked at the trial transcripts of some of these werewolves, what they did was what serial killers do. Um, and, and, and so I realized that you know, people at that time could not imagine a, a human being doing what they did. Um, yeah. and, and so they imbued these serial killers with these supernatural qualities of being vampires and um, werewolves. But if you read what they actually do and how they behaved, um, their relationship to other members in the community where they were apprehended with the victims and so forth, you're reading serial killer accounts. Um, and, and, and so... Um, we've always had serial killers in our society, except we, we call them different things. Yeah, yeah. I have a quick question for you about, uh, you've had a lot of uh, background in film, and I wonder what you think about how serial killers are portrayed in film and television, and if that has any impact on this. Well, you know, I think it depends on the era. Um, you know, when you look at something like uh, Silence of the Lambs, uh, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. that, uh, that in itself uh, made the serial killer as a kind of an anti-hero celebrity. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not Clarice Starling of the FBI who's the, the star of that movie, Jodie Foster. <laughs> it's Anthony Hopkins' portrayal of, uh, you know, um, Hannibal the Cannibal. Um, and in fact, there are two serial killers in that movie. Uh, mm -hmm. One yeah. is a good serial killer, Hannibal the Cannibal. We, um, you know, all would enjoy having dinner with Hannibal, as long as we're not on the menu. But yeah. <laughs> dinner with Hannibal the Cannibal. He's articulate, he's uh, smart, he's witty. Uh, but remember Buffalo Bill, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, know? Yeah. Um, you know, we wouldn't even want to be seen with Buffalo Bill, uh, let alone uh, having any kind of contact uh, with him. So he's the bad serial killer. And, and, and so we get this uh, um, kind of stream and culture of glorified celebrity serial um, uh, killers, which... Um, you know, it's not a healthy thing, but, you know, there's very little healthy in popular culture anyway. <laughs> but um, you do get this kind of, um, you know, mythology around serial killers, for example, that they're, you know, super intelligent, super uh, smart. The average serial killer is of average or below average intelligence. What they do have is this um, amazing animal-like cunning to spot a weakness in a, in a victim, to separate um, the weak from the herd. Yeah. Well, that's what serial killers have, and often we misinterpret that as, as intelligence. But, um, yeah. you know, there's no Hannibal the Cannibal uh, brilliant articulate <laughs> serial killers out there. Yeah, and, you know, I would be remiss. If, I know we're getting short on time here, but I would be remiss if I did not ask you, about Richard Cottingham and what's been yes. going on with him recently and his uh, confessions. We've been um, interrupted by the COVID uh, issue. Um, a lot of it has to do with uh, kind of the personal contact that I have with Richard Cottingham along with um, a person I'm working with, Jennifer Weiss, one of Cottingham's... Um, the daughter of one of the victims. The daughter of one of his victims, um, which, you know, is important to Cottingham as Cottingham is late in life um, trying to face his own immortality. And, and, and so Jennifer, as the daughter of one of his torso victims in New York, 
it's you know it's it's, it's like his victim reaching out from the grave through her daughter, mm-hmm. um, and and so Cottingham, as he thinks about his mortality, is trying to set things right as best as he can. He it's not. I would not describe him as having remorse, but I would describe him as um, having cognitive remorse. He understands yeah. Yeah. what it is and what he has to do, even though he doesn't feel it inside. He, he, he won't have an emotional understanding of it, but he has an intellectual understanding of it. And, and, and so um, things are happening. Last January, you know, we released information that he had confessed to three more murders in New Jersey going back to 1968 and 69. And that was on top of six already, right? He was already in for six. That's right. Yeah. Um, so now it makes it nine. He claims 80. Um, there's Things are on the move. We're all sort of girding up now, including Cottingham, for um, uh, this COVID era to kind of ease a little bit and and for us to be able to conclude as best as we can what Cottingham has remaining to um, confess to. So it's um, it's ongoing and it's happening and, and we're not just sitting around waiting. There's, there's yeah. stuff that's, that, that's happening that probably within a year will become public and I'll be ready to write my book as well. I'm uh, you know, this book I've been working on since I've met him in 2018, um, in a way I wrote American Serial Killer as a substitute for what was going to be my book on Cottingham mm-hmm. because I still don't know what the ending is. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have the beginning, I have the middle. I um, don't have yet the ending as things are currently happening. Well, I hope you'll come back and update us. Um, yes, I hope I will too. I hope uh, we do come to some kind of conclusive um, ending. It'll <laughs> make it a lot easier for me to write the book, that's for sure, if I have an ending for it. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yes. Does, it, does it change you um, spending a lot of time with, with someone like Cunningham? It, of course it's strange. Um, and and I think the strangest thing kind of is as well um, – the kind of creeping normalcy of mm. my conversations with him and um, our interactions, because um, as a serial killer, Cottingham is, you know, very, quote, normal in the sense that there's nothing twitchy about him. There are no uh, kind of crazy flights of fantasy. Yes, he has a huge ego, um, but... He, he, you know, he appears to me as normal as he must have appeared to his wife and children. Um, uh, you know, he raised three kids. He maintained uh, a steady job for 14 years um, without anybody seeing anything unusual about him other than his, you know, propensity to drink and gamble. And 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 so there was kind of this rebellious aspect to to non-conforming aspect to Cottingham in terms of, uh, you know, the kind of petty things he did. As I say, he had mistresses as 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 well. But, you know, his his um, younger sisters adored him right to the end and, and still cannot believe that their older brother committed these uh, crimes. They're, they're just... It, doesn't compute with the reality that they saw. And I see that when I interact with Cottingham, I can't imagine how his family, um, be- you know, believed him and liked him. He's a very amiable, good humored individual. And I think that very, um, amiability is exactly what lured all these victims into his um, web. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and didn't you, forgive me if I'm mistaken here, but 
didn't you speak from personal experience that he didn't seem like, you know, didn't have horns and things? Didn't you have cross paths with him once before he was arrested? Well, yes. Um, I, I, that's how I began writing about serial yeah. killers. <laughs> you know, I, I described Cottingham as, quote, my serial killer in, in the sense he was a serial killer I had encountered briefly. Um, as he was fleeing the, the scene of the torso murders. In, in fact, just before we went to record, um, we spoke about that movie I worked on in Arizona. Um, it was partly shot in Toronto, partly shot in Arizona, and we would um, process, there was a special processing called flashing that was used at that time, and mm-hmm. Toronto Labs didn't know how to do it. And so it was on that movie that I would be sent sent to New York to bring film to this laboratory and then wait overnight for them to process it and flash it, and then I would fly back with it to Toronto. Right? And and so on one of those trips down to New York, I ended up trying to check into a hotel one morning where Cunningham had um, just set these torsos on fire and fled with two severed heads, and we bumped into each other and uh, on the elevator as he was fleeing, and that, you know, the term serial killer didn't exist at that time. That was December of 1979. Um, you know, the term won't appear publicly, at least, you know, in the law enforcement community, it's it's now circulating, but publicly in public discourse, serial killer doesn't come up until New York Times uses it in May of 1981 to describe Wayne Williams, the yeah. Atlanta child murderer. And um, I had no sense of who or what serial killers were. For me, it was like encountering one of those Alfred Hitchcock movie monsters. Um, yeah. We had serial killers, but we just didn't call them that. And every one was kind of an individual aberration. And, and, and so I became fascinated with, you know, what the hell is this all about? And in fact, the first book I turned to was Anne Rules, um, The Stranger Beside Me. Mm-hmm. about Ted Bundy, and, uh, you know, that's one of the definitive books uh, about a serial killer, kind of starts a whole new true crime genre, but when Anne Rule published that book, the word serial killer does not appear in it. Even she had not yet heard that term or, or, or used it in her book. So um, once we have the term, we have kind of the, quote, diagnosis, we begin to understand that, you know, serial killers can appear to be like us, um, uh, you know, among our neighbors and so forth. Um, My encounter with Richard Cottingham, I I did not associate him with what occurred, what I realized occurred some 10 minutes later upstairs in that hotel, because I just didn't have a notion of serial killers. Um, I only connected him to it when I saw his photograph um, at least a year later once he was arrested and put on trial, when I realized, geez, that's the guy who annoyed me um, on the elevator. And he annoyed me because he held up the elevator up on this floor as I was waiting below. And so when he came down, I, I kind of gave him a, you know, a dirty look, you you know, you jerk off. How long does it take to get on an elevator? You know, it was probably 40 seconds, but I'm young, I'm impatient, uh, you know. So I did take a hard look at him, and I recognized him in the picture. But once I got up, uh, you know, to his floor and and walked kind of into the smoke of the fire, um, I completely forgot about the guy on the elevator. I mean, I just made no association with the jerk off on the elevator <laughs> with the potential of this monster that did what he did up on the fourth floor of, of the hotel. Um, I would have probably, if I had been equipped now with the concept of a serial killer and, and so forth. You know, John Douglas's and um, Ann Burgess's uh, book, uh, the, the one in which... Um, sexual homicide? Yeah. Motives. That, yeah, sexual homicide patterns and motives, which which kind of sets up the model for uh, what w- used to be the FBI profiling system, organized, disorganized, mixed categories. Um, that book only comes out in 1986. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, even the term serial killer it comes out earlier than, than that book. And so once 
we begin to understand serial killers as a kind of species, we begin to have certain expectations of them. And, and had I had those expectations, I might have made that association with um, the guy on the elevator. I mean, I probably would have gone to the police the next day um, because I, I, you know, I just, you know, the next day I picked up the film from the lab and got on the airplane and went home. And my story to all my friends over drinks and dinners was about checking into a hotel with these burning bodies in it or trying to check into that hotel with these burning bodies that the encounter on the elevator was completely forgotten out of my mind. I did not associate it with what happened upstairs. Yeah. I would have if, if I knew what serial killers were and how they functioned. Huh. Hmm. Wow. Now, uh, do you have uh, a website people can come find you on, or how do you like people to come find you? Well, they can find me on, uh, they can find my books on petervronsky.com. Uh, they can find my other stuff on petervronsky.org. Um, all the websites are kind of interconnected, so either one, petervronsky.com, petervronsky.org. Okay, fantastic. We will have that up on our site as well and the station, um, you know, um, so how's the COVID, has COVID affected your writing? Um, it's made it easier. I have, uh, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, writing is like being in COVID anyway, right? In, in yeah. COVID lockdown. Quarantine. You know, lockdown, yeah. right? Um, it, it's, uh, you know, most of my the book I'm writing right now on, on Cottingham is very different in the sense that I'm interacting with this individual and I'm out in the field looking for bodies and, um, you know, we're still searching for uh, Dita Godarcy's severed head, which Cottingham is doing his best to help us locate, uh, along with the other victim who is still unidentified. Um, so this book is different in the sense that I have to be more out in the field, but my previous works were kind of academic research works um, I never wanted to talk to any serial killers. There's enough recorded interviews with serial killers where the people who interview them essentially ask the same questions I would have asked. So there was really nothing that I had to ask a serial killer that hadn't been asked and responded to. So I didn't need to go out in the field. Um, even with Richard Cottingham, uh, you know, the only question I had was, does he remember me from that <laughs> encounter? Um, uh, you know, so um, uh, it was, it's more difficult writing this book because of COVID, because we have lost essentially a year. We made that announcement um, last January, and, uh, you know, February, we were going to go into another session with him. And then, of course, COVID hit, and it's been kind of everything has been suspended in terms of physically seeing him. I'm in contact with him by email and by telephone, uh, but, um, you know, personal visits have been right now off um, the agenda. And, and, and so this book is definitely COVID has an impact on it. The um, American serial killers, uh, I had just finished as the COVID um, pandemic was beginning. So it, it was edited kind of during the lockdown period. But um, it's easier to write if you, you know, if you can't go anywhere. That's what you're supposed to be doing when you're writing anyway, not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes it happens. <laughs> yeah. And I think people as well, readers, have more time to read. So I, I haven't seen yet a, any kind of major um, impact on, on my royalties from the past books. It seems as people are still reading as much as they did before. Not really much more, not less. So, um, you know, yeah. hopefully we're getting out of it. Uh, I'm <laughs> optimistic that at least by the next fall, although here in Canada we're way behind now the rest of the world in terms of vaccinations. 
Yeah. Apparently, I'm my age group isn't going to be eligible till June for crying to, for crying out loud. Um, oh well, you're still a young man, so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, Peter, it's been a pleasure as always. Um, the book we're talking about, American Serial Killers, The Epidemic Years, 1950 to 2000. And Peter Vronsky's the writer and our guest. Thank you for being here. And thanks for having me on, guys. It was a pleasure. Fascinating. Perfect. How was that for you, Peter? It sounds good, guys. Good. Great, Alan. Thanks a lot. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.